the maps for me and you. Oh, the Rosie is their name. That dance is the latest game. Well, welcome to a special, special edition of the R&R &R Show. Sit back and relax and enjoy the best little sports show ever. I'm your host, Michael Roop, and this is my co-host, William Rumsey. Hello, William. Howdy. All right. Well, today we have a special, special guest, uh, none other than Hank Johnson, a.k.a. Tiny. Tiny, yeah. thanks for uh, joining us You're today, welcome. buddy. Well, yeah. listen, we've got uh, a lot of stuff I know that uh, me and William uh, want to ask. And, uh, and also our fans, and we'll get to that a little bit later because there's a few fan questions that uh, they definitely want to pick your brain. And uh, obviously, we'll just jump right in. You started with the Bengals, I believe, in uh, 1975. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, and uh, you know you were with them for basically 25 years. Yes, I was. Yeah, so you've seen a lot, you've heard a lot, you've done a lot, and you've been a part of both Bengals Super Bowls. And I'm going to have to say... They may need to bring you back so they get back to the Super Bowl <laughs> since, uh, you know, you uh, you were a part of both of those. So that's a, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it hasn't been uh, that great since uh, you've been gone. So, but that being said, you've got a lot, a lot of stories to share. And I want to jump right in uh, and just kind of go with your first year in 1975. Ironically, that was Paul Brown's last year as a, a head coach. Could you tell maybe the, the fans what it was like? Uh, what Paul Brown was like, uh, you know, obviously one of the forefathers of the NFL. Paul Brown was one of the best there ever was, and I think there's a lot of good coaches who were out there at that time, but PB obviously was the founder of football, basically. Yep. Uh, very intelligent, knew the game, but at the same time, he had a wonderful personality. Did he? He yeah. never met a stranger, never met a non-friend. So he had a pretty nice, yes, calm demeanor. Did. Yes, he did. Now, was, now was uh, you know, obviously he was, uh, you know, one of the pioneers of the game. I believe he even uh, is the one that uh, introduced the uh, the headsets and stuff uh, to the game of football. Uh, but you're saying he was a, a, a gentle giant, yes, so he to speak. Was. Yes, he was. Very, he invented a lot of things he came up with. You know, obviously the playbook. Yeah. Obviously the face mask. You yep. could just go on and on and on. Yeah. Wow. Because he loved the game, he loved what he did, uh, he liked the interaction with the players, and he was just an all-around great coach and a good guy. And, and even uh, you know, even more so, even the players. Uh, it sounds like even uh, anybody that worked for him, uh, he was just as nice as he could be. Also, once you worked with the Brown family, you were part of the family. Oh, that's pretty. And even players, ex-players, they've always treated you as part of the family. That's yeah. The nice thing about the organization, compared to a lot of different ones, you just didn't come and go. You always carried the Bengals. Well, now, go ahead. were you a Bengals fan prior to working for the Bengals? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Were you? So you grew, grew up, up in Cincinnati. Cincinnati? Absolutely. Good deal. Absolutely. I used to bowl with a guy by the name of Mick Codwell. Did a lot of bowling when I joined in the American Legion League up in Price Hill. And he was a timekeeper for the ground crew. Okay. And then Dave Pope was the superintendent. So he asked me one night, he said, you want to make a little extra money? Because converting the field over from baseball to football, working on the ground crew. And he just said, sure, I'd like to win. The rest of history, I was there 10 years and moved in the locker room for 15 after that. Wow. So so that, so that it all basically started in a bowling alley, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have over a few beers, <laughs> and you're right, uh, you know, basically. Maybe a few. It maybe a few. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. So, but again, they, uh, you know, that that's, you know, it's always interesting how these things start. And, uh, you know, obviously you uh, had a, a long career with the Bengals. Now, uh, and also in 1975, um, you know, the great thing about that year, even though Paul Brown uh, retired after that first year, uh, you got one year with uh, Bill Walsh. Yeah. Now, how was that? Was that was? Did you know the genius of Bill Walsh uh, right right before your eyes when he was what the quarterback yeah, coach? Bill Walsh and Tagger Johnson both was with Paul. Yep. And at the same time, and, and yeah, he was. And then, unfortunately, we met him in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Sixteen, <laughs> and that wasn't so pleasant then. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Bill Walsh was a wonderful coach. They. PB had some coaches under him that were outstanding. You can go on Don Shula. Yeah. You can go right down the line. A lot of coaches coached under PB, and he brought out the best in them. Yeah. There's no doubt. 
Yeah. It was just that way. But Bill was, but Bill was a good uh, guy. I know yes. he was a stickler for uh, precision and yes, uh, stuff, you know, and stuff of that nature. But repetition precision. Yep, yeah, and he got the, he got a lot out of uh, you know. I think Ken Anderson got uh, a year or two under him. Did he not? Yeah, he did. I think he had one year, maybe two. Okay. And then Tiger Johnson took over and then went on. And uh, fourth grade come along not too long after that. Yep. But, uh, uh, speaking of Ken Anderson, how do you feel about his Hall of Fame? Credentials and or not being inducted yet. And I agree with my old boss, Mike Brown. He should be in the Hall of Fame. There's no doubt. Yeah. Um, from what I've seen, you know, just working with the club, he's one of the best. And you took a Division three quarterback, and he just could do anything with the ball. He's just very calm, collected, never got shook. Yeah, I saw he got it done. What was his college? Al Albuquerque? Augustana College. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I was looking at that today. Yeah. I was like. Did well, not know that. You know, and, and you know, Bill Walsh had a, a lot to do with, uh, you know, because Ken really mastered that precision mm -hmm. timing game early, early on uh, mm -hmm. because uh, his completion percentage was always the top of the NFL. Mm -hmm. And, it, uh, you know, it, it's crazy. When you got in there, uh, a lot of the Bengal fans watching uh, probably ha wasn't around or did not get to see that they – the Bengals were really good in the 70s. That's you know, it, it, the, it was a shortened playoff system, uh, and, you know, they always, uh, unfortunately, were in the division with the Steelers, uh, and, and they had some really, really good years where, the, you know, maybe a, a, a 10 and, well, there was a 14-game season. They would be like 10 and 4 and right. not make the playoffs, which was a shame some of those years in there because right. uh, well, we had they had six. some – Preseason games, we had six preseason games, and they changed that later. Yeah, thank God. Nobody wants to watch preseason, Tiny. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> so, so, tell us about your role with the Bengals. Well, what I did is work on the ground crew uh, for 10 years. Um, we just basically changed the field over from baseball to football. Okay. And then during the game, you know, during Saturdays and Sundays, during the game, we had a lot of things to do off the field. We had to set up the sidelines. We had to go upstairs and take care of press boxes and programs and flags around the stadium. And basically make sure everything ran on the sideline and run the goalpost had to be put up and all that stuff. Okay. And everything on the sideline, like I said, get all the gear out for the uh, the officials when they were in the game and stuff like that. Now on game day, how, how long did that typically uh, take to get uh, prepped for uh, for the day of the game? Say you had a 1 o'clock game. Right. What time were you getting in there and uh, starting to get things About rolling? 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. Okay. All right. Most of what we did pre-Saturday and then mostly going. So usually... Between 7 and 9, we usually came in and got things going. Gotcha. Because the fans were allowed in, well, I think, two hours before the game was 11 o'clock. So okay. We kind of had everything going by then. Well, gotcha. So, you know, kind of a little bit, uh, kind of fast forwarding a little bit out of the 70s, we, we've got the uh, the 80s, which uh, one forced Greg uh, came in and really had a nice little four-year run with, uh, with the team. Now, you know, tell me how forced was because, you know, as a kid, I remember watching him on TV, and he, he, he always looked like he was pissed off. Now, now was that was that exactly his persona, or is it, was that just his look? I got I went in the locker room in 85. Tom asked me to come in and help him, and I did. as was a locker room attendant uh, with another fellow named Denny who was in there already. And uh, Forrest was a, a unique guy. One thing about it, he knew the game. Yeah. But he was a big giant. He had big mass. He dwarfed me. Yeah. And uh, Your big guy, he was too. very intense. Uh, very quiet, you know, just didn't say much. He didn't yeah. have to say much because yeah. he would challenge him. Yeah. The only time I really seen him got mad was in the game we played Pittsburgh, and, and I believe it was on a Monday night. It was a night game. I don't know if it was Sunday or Monday night. Keith Gary grabbed Kenny Anderson's face mask and just ripped it in the back of his head. And uh, the guy that did the Hagger, nice Hagger commercials, and this is the first year I went to locker room, I was still a ball boy, done the Hagger commercials. Dagger pants or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Commercial. He came over to sign like this four station number. He says, Why is that man not thrown out of this game? Because they called a penalty out. Yeah, yeah. He says, Monday night football, coach, I can't. Oh. And wow. Forrest turned beat red, and I thought he was going to grab me for a minute. Oh, yeah. He might have done a Woody Hayes little yeah. action there. He didn't challenge Forrest. Yeah. Says that. Yeah, well, that's that's interesting uh, little tidbit that uh, you know those primetime games back then they meant a, a lot more where they yes, they, they didn't uh, you know they didn't uh, they let some stuff go. I think you could answer it a different way, but that was yeah, yeah, no, I just didn't like it. 
Yeah, no, I get it. So, so again, uh, Forrest obviously led the Bengals to their uh, their first Super Bowl there uh, in '81, and ironically, that was, I believe, the uh, the first year the Bengals switched over from their iconic just Bengal helmet to the stripes. Was it not? Yes. Now, what? Now, was was you a part of uh, you know doing the helmets too? Yes, I was. Yes, I was. Paul Brown picked the stripes. Okay. There's a lot of helmets they had out there because they had to have the Bengals name off the side of the helmet. I guess the NFL wanted it. And, oh, is that and, why that came yeah, about? Yeah, they were moving into properties by then, and they, things they had to look good on the sideline. Television got involved in that. Yeah. And PB picked the stripes, and there were six stripes, two on each side. And they were wonderful design, and, and I did a lot of that. That was our big thing during the week. For a game, we started on uh, we started on Wednesday. After practice, we well, we looked at a few and spotted some stuff like that. But then there's some you know that you had to do that fixing that. We did this stripes at the same time we had to fix the helmets. The hardware had to be replaced. Some of the masks were tore up from the game before. So, but the stripes, we got into it on Friday. And Friday evening, it stayed late. And Drew, we do about uh, half the half the return stripes. Like I said, there's six stripes. I could probably do it in my sleep. So. <laughs> Still, okay. Now I painted on, which yeah. is kind of nice. But it was an icon. It was nice to do it because that was something that set our team out. Yeah. And the yeah. It set our team out. They know it's the Bengals and nothing else. Well, and the Saturday. Bengals certainly earned their stripes that year with that Super so Bowl. So Friday, Saturday, and Sunday we did stripes. Did the, the stripes. Right for the game, yeah. So, go ahead. I was going to say, so, you know, obviously you think highly of Ken Anderson. What was that transition like from Ken Anderson to Boomer Esiason? Boomer, Boomer was a um, high-spirited guy, different outgoing guy, mm -hmm. New York guy, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. All the New York guys are outgoing. And Boomer brought a lot to the game because he just had enthusiasm. And Kenny, not that Kenny didn't, just he showed it in a different way. Yeah. Uh, of course, Boomer moved around a lot better. He could, you know, could do it. Like, and he was great at that naked reverse. He could just hide the ball. You yeah. didn't know where it was. That, that's what I remember most yeah. about. Uh, th those re yeah. those, uh, those um, play fakes were second to none. I like both of them. Kenny was, I knew Kenny longer, so I'd say he's probably one of my favorite. Mm -hmm. Of course, Boomer. And in Montoya. And so did Kenny retire? I mean, yes, I, he did. He retired. He retired, and that's when Boomer, Boomer came come in. And Boomer took over the next year. And okay. what year? Do you remember what year that was? I did the thing. I, yeah, I was going to say, was it 86? I think I say Boomer was drafted 85. in 84. 84, okay. okay. The next year. Kenny okay. Was yeah, yeah and, I, and you know, I don't know, did Turk uh, Schoener get any uh, time in there? No, I don't. I think I, Turk left by then. Turk, yeah, Turk was taking the beating back from back. the Steelers whenever he got in there. <laughs> It sounds familiar for yeah. Bengals quarterback. Yes. But our Super Bowl year, Turk Turner saved us. And if you remember, we played Houston Orders the first game. Yep. And Kenny had a very bad first half. He got benched? And Force benched him and put uh, Turk in. Wow. And we ended up winning the game. I believe it was, I think they had 21. They were beating us 21 and a half time. And I think we ended up winning the game, whatever score it was, 24 and, 21 or whatever it was. And to Kenny's credit, he came back and had an MVP season. So That's why wow. he asked Forrest, so who's your quarterback next week? Kenny Anderson. He just had a bad day. Yep. He's at the bottom is this, who's up next? Yep. You can't play, get out of the way. I got the next guy behind yep. me. Yep. That's very cool. Absolutely, so, absolutely. MVP yeah. year. Yep. So uh, the game, I want to talk a little bit. I'm, I'm, this is one of the questions I've been very interested in asking you. The game leading up to that uh, Super Bowl uh, was the uh, Freezer Bowl. Now talk a little bit about the freezer bowl, <laughs> and uh, you know maybe exactly what you were feeling. Could you feel anything? How much layers did you have that day, and what was it like? Not enough. Yeah, I was going to say tell 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 the fans a little bit about that freezer bowl. Well, two things about the freezer bowl. Number one, you know, it was our first AFC championship game yep. to go to the Super Bowl, and there was a guy on the other side of the field by the name of James Brooks. Yep. And uh, which ended up being our team in this yep. year because obviously they traded for Pete Johnson. Which come great because he was a super guy. And oh, yeah. What we needed. But we layered up the ground crew. John Murdo got us all ready, and we just hit layer and layer and layer. And I, to this day, I still have a frostbite on my ear from that. So, <laughs> no kidding. So, oh, yes. It was a cold day. We started early that day. Uh, and it was right after the Who concert, if you remember yeah. that. Yeah. But he had all that trouble, so we had to have all the gates open. John had to make, we hung, go outside and hanging up signs. We all had masks on, and somebody had just recently robbed. One of the concession stands not too long before that. I don't know if it was at who or the stadium the week before with a mask. So, you know, we're all in masks outside. And of course, everybody's security, on security. Yeah. 
We had to pull it up constantly, you know. And you didn't like that. <laughs> very, very cold. I can imagine. It was tough being a ball boy on the sideline. And I believe it was a minus 59 degree wind chill that day. Uh, so now, so you were... Um, Change socks. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, so oh, yeah. I mean, how many layers? I, I couldn't imagine... I, was there was there any plays or hits that you thought that guy isn't going to get up because nobody wants to get hit when they're cold, let alone minus fifty nine degrees. I say the San Diego team they were on the sun side and they still were cold. They yeah. didn't like it at all. Yeah, they did not like it at all. Fourth grade come out the first half in short sleeves, yeah. and so did the offensive lineman. Oh man! Now, the second wow. half he put his coat on. Yeah. Well, we, had, we had to shave him. Yeah, wow. but that was a. A mind thing, for yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely. Well, that, that, that you know, because I remember as a kid, uh, seeing some of these idiots out in the stands with no shirts on. I'm thinking to myself, minus 59 degrees. Now, now, can you talk a little bit about uh, to the fans maybe what the uh, what those footballs were like, you know, and, and those kind of temperatures? Um, we wrapped them up, they wrapped them up, we wrapped them up with towels and handbags and stuff, trying to keep them as warm as we could. But it's just the weather. Yeah. It's just part of, you know, we're on the sideline, we had them wrapped in our arms and towels. And then, of course, kept them in a bag. We didn't leave them on the ground or nothing like that. Either. Yeah. So, that, yeah. I bet you were wanting to be nestled up to that space heater yeah, they used to have on the That was there. That was close. They had one on each end of the bench, and you stayed close. Yeah, to yeah. I, I can only imagine. So, the first Super Bowl you did not attend. No. And then you got right. to attend the second one. First one was in Detroit. Okay. We, the ground crew didn't go at the time. Okay. And then the second one, Mike invited everybody in. So the, even the front office and everything. We went down the second week uh, on a different plane because they obviously went the first week mm -hmm. for uh, you know your your meetings and your press and all that stuff. And uh, they did a little bit of practice, but anyway, we didn't get into our routine practice until Monday, and that's why Danny and I went down to help with the locker room. Tom had his son with him down there the first week, but that way we could help set up and get the game going and ready for the week because that was that was game week. Wow. Yeah. So, so talk a little bit about uh, you know after the fourth Greg era, we've got the Sam Weish era, uh, and you know it, it seems to me the Sam's uh, was near and dear to your heart. Uh, talk, tell, tell the fans a little bit uh, what Sam was like, you know, away from the cameras, just you know, to, on the practice field, away from everybody. Sam, the difference between Sam and Force, obviously Force was a, just a nose nonsense guy, but he got the job done. Yep. And he expected it from you. And if, if both of them said, if you listen, the first thing is, what are you going to do, coach, when you start? The first thing we're going to do is put a winning attitude. Yep. you got to want to win. Everybody's got to be on the same page. We're going to win. So we got to change that attitude. Sam Sam was a part-time magician, if you didn't know that. No, I did not. Uh, yes. In fact, uh, when PB invited us up to, in the summer camp, he'd have a little you know, festival outdoor cookout for the families. Uh-huh. And uh, he'd do his magic tricks. A part-time magician. Oh yeah, he used to do it in the locker room and quite a, you know, during meetings and stuff like that. He was kind of, so that was Sam. He was outgoing about it. He was funny sometimes, but he could be really hard at sometimes too. I can't imagine there were too many other NFL head coaches that were part-time magicians. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's quite the resume. And the great thing about Sam, he was a, he was a really innovative. He was another Bill Walsh. Yes, he was. Um, mm -hmm. And another PB. Yep. You know. PB come up with a lot of things they never done before, like for the pass and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Sam come up, of course, the hurry up offense. Yep. Of course, Marv Levy tried to take. Well, yeah, yeah Marv Levy takes, well, tries to take credit, but that's not the but that's not the case. From. Yeah. And Sam was always like that, always thinking out the box. We can do this, we can do that, with the right guys. You know, we got this guy, we can do this at this time, and just got everybody to believe in it. And once they did, to see it works. It was, yeah, on, it was on then. You know, to piggyback off your comment of the uh, the Marv Levy trying to take, uh, you know, uh, credit for that, they were the ones crying, if I remember, in that champion, AFC championship game about the Bengals, mm -hmm. uh, you know, doing the hurry off offense, saying it was illegal, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. And it was totally legal, but then, you know, they quickly found out that that's the way the uh, the offense is going. Right. This, and they took the, it was took a new the, age they took the page out of uh, Sam's book, but you're you're spot on with your assessment on Sam doing that. In fact, um, they made a rule after that because Marv kept taking timeouts yep. all the time, and they finally made a rule after that during the two-minute warning now. If you take a timeout, if you take an uh, injury, Take an injury or even have an injury, time yep. you lose time out. And, and to pick you back, the clock. I, if I remember even on that run in the playoffs, gosh, this is my memory is still pretty locked in. I remember them playing Seattle uh, Seahawks, which was in the AFC mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, and they, uh, uh, 
Nash was his name, a uh, uh, defensive uh, lineman for mm-hmm. Seattle, and he would come up lame, uh, faking an injury all the time to slow down the Bengals' offense uh, so they could get some personnel changes, which, you know, NFL knew they had to do something right. because there was just too many fake injuries and stuff of that nature going on. you got a mind like a steel trap. I do. And then <laughs> once, again, once again, you couldn't do that unless you get the right set of guys. We had, we had the right offense flying. We had the right man boomer behind there. And everything just clicked, and Sam could just get it done. Because if you try to do that, you're not ready for it. It totally messes your timing and everything else. So. During that era, I know that Chris Collinsworth played for the Bengals. Did you know Chris that well? Yes, did I you did. see anything in? I mean, I know he was a great receiver, but did you see anything in him that would lead him to become the media big media personality he is now? Yeah, he was a Florida guy. Not showing his blonde hair, and he just yeah. he was just an outgoing guy, and he just loved the game, and just. Love people and just yeah, I could see him being in in the Bronx like Bob Trumpy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Come. Then did you have a pretty good relationship with the Bob? Yeah, I knew Bob. Yeah, He's a good guy. Good, good, good. So, well, listen, uh, you know, I, I you know, a couple other things just to touch on Sam. I, I want to know where where Tiny was at the moment uh, Sam broke out. You don't live in Cleveland. You live in Cincinnati. Where were you? And uh, what did you think when uh, when that happened? Standing on the sideline, just shaking my head. Yeah. How, how far away were you from Sam when he broke well, that Well, he out? was across the field. Yeah, okay. And I was in the, the sidelines. Yeah. And I saw him run over there, and he, we knew what he was going to do. Yeah. He already said he was going to do it. And uh, that's Sam. He yeah. does things off the cuff. He does. If you remember one time when the, the women started wanting to come in the locker room and do interviews, which is fine, but we have to accommodate. You just can't. We started calling it with, with curtains and towels and stuff yeah. like that. You know, Sam, they wanted to come in, and he fought it to the end because he didn't believe in it. It shouldn't yeah. be that. If you remember, he did one of you, and he took his shirt off when I said, you want to see a naked man? Here you go. Here's a hip. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that interview? Yeah, I do, he actually. Was coming, he says, Tiny, take my shirt. So you're nice. Yeah. It's okay. You should have saved that uh, shirt. That, that would have been a very I don't, I don't remember that, so I'm going to have to go check yeah. it out. Yeah. 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 So t- tell uh, you know the fans at home. I know there's a lot of younger fans. How electric the city was during that last Super Bowl run. Because me as a kid, I remember just the the city was alive. I mean, the city yes, be- right. is basically it was a lot different uh, in that first Super Bowl run compared to this one. It just right. seemed like you know the whole who day. Everybody yelling who day. I don't care where you were if you were at a mall. I mean, everybody was happy, yeah. and there was a lot of uh, back slapping back in those days. It all started with the Browns family with the stripes. Yep. And then it evolved into Welcome to the Jungle, and then, of course, the Icky Shuffle, and then all that stuff, you know, and it just went on and on, the song and all that stuff. Yeah. It, it just got electrified, and the fans were just fired up. They just felt that nobody, if you remember, we won every home game in, in the Super Bowl season. Yep. And it was the longest season, and we started in the Football Hall of Fame. And that was a lot of season any any wow. team had that was in the Super Bowl. Now, did you ever do an icky shuffle yourself back no, in those days? <laughs> <laughs> I ahead, had no rhythm at all. So. <laughs> so last week, or was it two weeks ago now, that we interviewed Fulcher, David Fulcher. Um, so do you still, you know, I know you still have a relationship with yes. David. Do you have any relationship with any other Bengals, still correspond with any oh, others? Oh, yeah. I, I, quite a few of them I run into every now and then. When Tom Gray passed away, we went to the funeral when he was there. You know, some of the guy Walters and stuff like that. But Joe Walters had a good relationship. Anthony Munoz, Jimmy Breach, see him a lot. Yeah. You know, you see Tom Dink. Well, you see some of the guys. And obviously, uh, you know, Vulture, I, I helped him a little bit with football for a couple of years. Yeah. And I still confer with him every now and then. Yeah. Super guy, one of the best. If he don't make the Hall of Fame, I don't know what's wrong because he had to be one of the biggest defensive yeah. backs ever. Oh, he was a pioneer for that oh, position. He was, he was. He absolutely he was. He, cha- he changed how that position was looked when at. I, when I showed him my picture, my knee replacing the day after I got it when I got home, he said, you, you look like you got hit by number 33. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so talk a little bit about uh, that uh, 49ers Super Bowl. Um, were, you know, I know a lot of players get nervous during that time. Did, was you nervous too? Yeah, I was nervous. I was in charge of the headsets then and stuff like that. Uh, but you just keep concentrating on what you got to do. The players were, and they all wanted their own little the superstitions they all had. You yeah. know, we had guy that used to bring us uh, an ABC cake that we had that the day before the game. And then, of course, some, somebody even sent us an Izzy Cadet corned beef FedEx. Stuff like that. So there were things that we did that, yeah. that we always done before yeah. the game. And like I said, I was in charge of the headsets then. And 
I always had them rolled up and ready to go, and I always had a vent next to him because I had one coach that always split one. Sam did on occasion, but not very much time. He he gave it back to me when he took off running. Yeah, because I was closer to him for that reason. But yeah. Dick Seltzer, if you remember, he lives in Delhi, played for an Elder, and uh, he would always come out. He was a linebacker coach, and he'd always bust the court every <laughs> game. Every because somebody they would stand on the seat yeah. just before they went with court. Yeah. And, you know, he'd go down the oh, field yeah. and give it a jerk, and it only oh, takes yeah. one jerk, oh, it's gone. Yep, I so can imagine. Those kind of things, the little things you want to make sure you got ready to go. Oh, yeah. So so talk a little bit about that Super Bowl, that last Super Bowl. You had mentioned, um, you know, you were, you were uh, you got a coup, which uh, had to be a thrill yes, of a yeah, lifetime. Totally. Yeah, uh, amazing. Uh, you know, obviously, the, uh, you know, leading up to the Super Bowl, the day of the Super Bowl, uh, there was an unfortunate event. Um, how did that play out? Uh, was you one of the uh, people that uh, found Stanley? Or? No, I wasn't. Jimmy Anderson was. Okay. One of the coaches. I wouldn't say. I shouldn't say any name. But anyway, the thing about that is the same thing Kansas City went through. Yeah. Stanley's part of the family. Cronenberg was part of the family. When those things happen, you know, you put it back in your mind, but you're still concerned about them. Yeah. They are a part of your family, and, and you know, you worry about them and concerned. They're very human concerned. beings. Yeah. He is part of the offense. Yeah. You know, he had to change the little things, you know. Business goes on as usual, like anybody going down there in the game. Next guy up, you yep. got to go. Uh, and, and Grant played a great game after Crumline went down. Yep. You know, he didn't miss a beat. But that works on everybody, too, because Fulcher always told him all the time, and I've heard him say it to the guys, look, just hold the guy long enough, Crumline's coming. Yeah. You know, yeah. Crumline was an All-American wrestler plus a football player. You knock him down, he was up and down the field. In yep. fact, he, I think he led the team in several years in tackles. Oh, no, he did. For a nose tackle. Uh, talking about Crum Ryan, that uh, gruesome injury, um, you know, I think I heard the other day that uh, he refused to leave the stadium after that. He, he made the uh, the medics keep him there so he could watch the rest of the game. If, if you know Crum Ryan, there was a, he had a nickname. His name was Taz in college. Yeah. Called him Taz Van Endeavor. <laughs> and uh, he got hurt and he knew he got hurt and he knew. Told Tom, said, you should have brought six back. I won't be here on the field a while. And they took him in the locker room, got him stable, took him in there. And they wanted to put him in the ambulance right away. He said, no, I'm going to the locker room. It's almost halftime. I'm waiting until my team comes in. And the guy says, look, you need to get, because I went in to help get his closer. He said, you need to get in. He says, you put me in that ambulance, and you're not going to have an ambulance. <laughs> so, okay, so he stayed, and they come in. They said hi to him, and then did all our meetings, a little stuff, and then, they walked back out and said hi to him, and they put him in the ambulance and took him. Now, Tim was a pretty colorful guy. Did, uh, you know, I, I think he, you know, I don't think it's any, uh, you know, surprise to anybody like to kick back a few beers. Did he, uh, did he get a little rambunctious in the bars every once in a while, maybe where you had to drag him out? <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> I, I didn't keep up with him, guys. I didn't even try. Yeah. He, he was just an intense guy, high yeah. intense, high energy, a super guy doing the world for you. And just loved the game. Yeah. yeah. He just loved the game. He thanked Mike several times for, you know, for being a Bengal, for being drafted. And he just was glad to be there. And he said in the strike year, he said, I'd, I'd play no matter what. You yeah. Know? In fact, he was one of the first ones that came in. Yeah. And uh, he he said, I'd play no matter if he didn't pay me. He said, I just loved the game. Yeah. And that's how he played. And that's how he lived. It, well, and it, and it showed on the field. So... Obviously, that Super Bowl, you'd been with the organization for 14 years yeah. at that point. Mm -hmm. So you were, I mean, you are part of the team. Highs, lows, all that stuff. Um, one of my first sports memories is that Montana pass. And I asked, the, to, to win the Super Bowl, I asked David Fulcher about it last week. What what was that like, experiencing that? Very good, Richie. Yeah. Uh, before that, though, Lewis Bill dropped the ball. Hit him right in the chest. Yeah, I remember. I mean, so... You can compare that to that. Uh, Montana's just a super quarterback. He had a super coach over there. And it just happened. Everything worked out to the fine. You know, and, and Jerry Rice was one of going to all day, and they changed up. And yeah. Sure enough, that happened. I was supposed to get the... the uh, every team gets a box of Super Bowl champ shirts and hats. So obviously, whoever's going to be there, they want you to have them on soon. The game's yeah. over. You mm -hmm. saw it with Brady just recently and stuff like that. Yeah. That was my job to go to him, hand him by the door. He had a guy sitting at the end of the bench with a cart ready to go. Yeah. And I was ready to go. And then. So, did you keep one of those uh, shirts of the no, so called? I didn't, uh, want I didn't want it. Yeah. I didn't want it. <laughs> now, did, now, after some, like the Super Bowl, did you guys 
stay down there for a little bit or or did you guys just pack up and go that mm-hmm. next night? The next day. Next day. Yeah. Was that a pretty somber uh, yeah, plane we, ride home? Or we had a oh you know, yeah it was. We had an after a, you know every team has an after party after, yeah yeah Super Bowl party, and obviously and uh, ours was very quiet. Yeah, I can we imagine with the Stanley. You didn't see much dancing. You didn't hear much shuffling. You didn't hear much. No. You no, know, you're numb. You're numb. You know you done the best you could do. You left it all on the field, and you just didn't. Come up with the, the right score. That's all. Yeah. Well, with Crumb Ryandry and Stanley Wilson, yeah, and that took a little bit more extra air out of the uh, yeah. the thing. So, uh, go ahead, Willie. We got. Uh, I've got just a question. Go ahead. You want me to ask? Uh, yeah, we got a hey, real sure. quick. We want to ask a, a couple fan questions here, Man, real quick. Yeah. So I've got from, <laughs> Brian Heim. So, what is something the Brown family does out of kindness that gets no? Publicity. So this question stems from our fan base being quick to judge based on the wins and losses. Um, he's critical of the organization. He roots for unconditionally. He feels like they do a lot of good that doesn't get the headlines, rightfully so. But it's nice to hear the other side of the negativity. Well, I agree with him. I root for him still, and I don't work for him anymore. Yeah. Um, the Brown family does it a whole lot, really. But the biggest thing I think they do do, which they've done for me, is once you work for them, they treat you like family. When you're working for them, when you're there, even a lot of players after they leave, there's a lot of things they do for players that nobody ever knows about. And Mike still does today. And, uh, you know, you just, he's a very private man. Yep. That's the way he wants it, and he does a wonderful job. And he's really good to people that have been around him. And he really thanks them a lot. And, you know, he helped my family. You know, when I was there, my kids all got to be part of it and stuff like that. And, and so, and I know he, I know I, I'm not going to name players. But I know he can do a lot but, for other players, and he does a lot. And I know for a fact. So that's cool. But that's the biggest thing. He, he and I know there's a whole lot of other things they do, but I, I'm not really privy to it. I don't want to know. Sure. It. It's just that I know that once you've been part of the family, you're always part of the family. And I could that's, probably that's see that fun. because uh, you know even even His sometimes in you know staying a part of the family. I know sometimes. Uh, uh, players or coaches, they'll, they'll keep around a little bit longer than probably a lot of so-called experts think they should just because they're loyal yeah. to, to, you know, you are a part of that Bengal family. And that's their way of thanking you. Yep, so exactly. What, what made you wrap up your career with the Bengals? Well, Tom retired, and the new guy come in decided, you know, that we didn't need me anymore, so that was fine. I mean, I had a good run with Tom. I yeah. enjoyed it. Tom was great to me. 15 year old longer than that, you know, but he was a super guy. He was kind of like a, an older brother to me. Yep. I didn't even say a father. I don't think he was that much. He was like 13 years older than me, but you know, yeah, maybe sure. 16, 17. But he was just a wonderful guy. I enjoyed working for him. He was, a, he was the, the only employee they brought from Cleveland down with him. Okay. Oh, wow. And he was okay. the first equipment manager. And he did a wonderful job. We helped him, and he did all the organization and all the stuff. And we were just giving notes about we're missing this, we need this, we need that. But to be able to move a team of 57 guys with all the equipment you need on one Sunday, we see we had a, we moved every week. You know, we had to go down to the front stadium. We, we actually had a away game every week. We never played at home. Yeah. Wow. You know, we played in our stadium, but we had to move all the equipment down oh. and get it ready. See? Yeah. And he had it down to the science. It was unbelievable. And, and it's great to be around and great to see it. Yeah. I, I can only imagine all the moving parts uh, and stuff like that because, uh, you know, for some of the fans at home don't remember, the Bengals used to do their training camp at Wilmington mm-hmm. College. You know, that was a little uh, barbaric, I'm sure. But I'm sure the accommodations weren't quite comfy <laughs> over there, were they not? They're not quite as comfy. Yeah, because I, 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 I don't know. Did they have AC in those rooms or no? No, most of them didn't, and most of them brought their own. Oh, oh man, wow. I, you know, that so no, sort of, sounds Church like my ball stays dorm. Yeah, well, I got it. Me, I have Eric Lowe's, if you're watching, he remembers. <laughs> I got that doctor's note to get the AC in our room. <laughs> But but uh, for the uh, the fans of him, that just shows you how how barbaric some of that stuff was back in the day. For the, to mm-hmm. think an NFL team would be having training camp and not being staying with uh, with anything with the uh, AC right. and and very li- it's like a dorm room basically because that's, that's what it was. It was a dorm room at Wilmington College. So, mm-hmm. uh, but I remember uh, you know some of those characters during that time. Uh, Dave Remington. 
he was always a, a character that liked to have fun. He enjoyed, I mean, it was sad to see when they moved uh, from the uh, the Wilmington College. Right, right. But that was a tradition that PB did for years. You'd always, you get away from the normal stuff to get ready for camp because you get several, you know, you got a big exploded team, you're a big number team, you yep. got to get it down to a certain kind. Yep. It gives you a chance to do that. Yep, yep. So, uh, so uh, one of my, uh, one of our other fans' uh, questions, Sean Messmore, uh, wanted to know who was the Bengal you most enjoyed being around and one that maybe you did not. <laughs> well, so, I didn't like being around Timmy whenever I had to f fix his helmet on the weekend and change the mask and do stuff like that. Okay, he did well, not like that at all. No, Tim, Tim didn't like that? No. <laughs> He's like a bear in a closet. There were a few times, there was a few times the helmet come my way and I had to duck. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, so he, he, he was up, but, you know, he wore his uh, emotions on his sleeve, yes. but sometimes you would have to get the gruff of that. But I had to do it. Well, you get a lot of time. I wouldn't say there's one player. I'd say there's several. Like I said, Kenny, I known him the longest, so obviously we had a great relationship. Yep. It was fun being around Boomer because he had a lot of energy. Yeah. A wonderful guy. But Anthony Mooney, by far, was a gentleman of gentlemen. Okay. You know, so you always, you always gravitated to him because he just, when he got on the field, he played super play, but he played in a, night, in a way that, it was, it was a nice way. He was very strong about it and very athletic. You just didn't get past him. Yeah. He wouldn't let you, but yet, you know, he was still a gentle gentleman on the sidelines. So there's a lot of guys I was around it. But you'd I probably say... One. I think you mentioned Jimmy Breach one time. Jimmy too, Breach. Too. Jimmy Breach was a super guy. What a kicker. Yeah. yeah. He was a super guy, a wonderful guy. He was just fun to be around. He was just excited about the game all yeah. the time. And those guys, most of them were just excited to play the game and then to be a kid. That's probably why they were successful during those years. You got it. Yeah. I mean, you picked, obviously, uh, Boomer, Ken, and, uh, you know, uh, Anthony... Three icons of the Bengals organization, and uh, you know, sounds Joe like Joe Walters and you know David Fulcher, and, and uh, you know I could go on and on. I mean, I could pick a dozen numbers. So, so, who, but just real quick, I I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but so who did you not like to be around? I know you said Tim, but that was just with a helmet. Yeah. Who, who was one that maybe <laughs> you put him on the spot? Who, who's the one that maybe that uh, just you know? Didn't rub you the right way. You, you, you know, we got along with most of them because we were putting in their locker what they needed. Yeah, so you're helping them. them. You're helping right, facilitate basically. stuff. Uh, but then again, we need a little feedback too. We just can't read your mind. And sometimes you can't read the mind of mindless like me. Yeah. But there, were, there was just a couple of them that, you know, really rubbed me a little bit. Not that I didn't stay away from them, just I did what they needed. and you know. Let Give us a down. name. Give us a name. I don't know if I could give a name. Come on, one name. Oh. One name you don't talk to anymore. Give us a well, Give the know, fans a name. You know, Corey Dillon could be a real <laughs> I guarantee. And, uh, we knew Corey. We knew Corey not, Dillon. Not you. that he was a bad thing. It's just that he always had expectations outside of what he wanted. You know, yeah. What you want and what you can do or get is two different things. Yeah. And he was really high strung and really a lot of course. He, he got a lot better because one day I found his uh, Visa gold card in the laundry and saved it for him. Oh. But I so should have ran up the street first and bought my <laughs> gold card. So that yeah. unthawed the relationship yeah, a little. Yeah, okay, very good stuff there. So, good stuff, go ahead. So obviously since you retired in 2000, uh, mm -hmm. probably even before that, the Bengals just, I mean, in a fan's eyes, we they wouldn't have what you would say as success. So what... I mean, we just want a playoff win. I saw something the other day. It's been 11,000 days since the playoff win. What do you see as the major stumbling block? At this I point? wouldn't say you didn't have a playoff team. You had Marvin Lewis had a great run. He had some they good had four or five years in a row. He had some good quarterbacks. He had some good, a bunch of good players. Uh, it's just a matter when you get to the end to step up that one notch. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it, it's a coach or if it's a player, a dominant player. Uh, obviously, Boomer. Demanded, you know, to do better, and Kenny, Kenny demanded the fact that, look, you know, you need to do this, you know, this is what we're doing. If not, you know, I need somebody. Yeah. And then Boomer would grab him by the next line. Especially when he got behind <laughs> something, he grabbed that lineman and brought him over and says, "Don't let that happen again." And, and you know, even the fact he hit him in the head with the ball. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just, just the, that leader. Just yeah. that. Sounds like it's a, a quarterback. Coach, could be a coach. Could be a quarterback. Could be another player, you know, just somebody that leads the team, and to get you past that point. Like I said, Bengals have had some great runs and great mm -hmm. games and great 
you know, they had some won some wonderful seasons. Yeah. They've been beautiful. Yeah. But you once again, the, the, the whole team's got to come together. And I'll share something real quick with you, what PB did with Sam. Remember, at the first year or two, we were with Sam. He had the team there. We were six and ten or whatever. And the team was there. And we had the boomer. We had the uh, linemen coming in, the running backs. It was there. And it was like it just wasn't mesh coming together. Well, PB, and I shared a story, and I hope uh, Tom, rest his soul, won't get mad at me. He told Tom one day, he said, remember what we used to do in Cleveland? How I used to set up my life. My meeting room, we just had it on the spinning and had a great big meeting room where everybody could be in instead of a little bitty one. And he says, yeah, he put the offense on one side, defense, put everybody's name on all the chairs and all the stuff. And that was our Super Bowl year. That was, we, you know, we went and played up in Akron first and went to the Super Bowl and put everybody's name in. Sam come back and lit in the town, lit in the town. <laughs> and after he got done and we're back there and after he finally got done, he says, I want to know this. You need to go up front in the front office there and see Coach Brown because... He's the one that did. He never heard no more. And I guess it just brought the cohesion together. And it just started from there. It just started going and going mm -hmm. and going. You could see it every week getting better, getting better. You know, we lost a few games, but we just kept, you know, why did we lose this game? In the next game, we won a game because this happened that we couldn't do the game before. And just, it's something like that. It just needs to go. And it, like I said, the players are there. You got some great players in this. This new quarterback's the real deal. There's no way so you cannot say he's not. Yeah. What little I know about football, <laughs> you cannot say he's, he's the bad deal. Yeah, correct. Yeah, I can see Boomer and Kenny and even Joe Montana a lot. Of oh, them. yeah. It's just a matter mm -hmm. for the other mm -hmm. players to work with him. See. I said, I mean, and the coaches. Watching Burrow play this year, if he would have had an offensive line, I mean, not that it would, not the greatest of offensive lines. And I watched the Super Bowl, Mahomes and Brady. I think he can get on that level. If they get him some blocking, I, I mean, just what I, like you said, yeah. limited what I, I saw him playing the national championship the game the year before, and then what I saw out of him this limited time this year, I think he can get him to that level too. Now the injury comes into play, see if he can Well, that it comes all the time. Sure. You know, Joe Walters didn't play in the Super Bowl, he had a busted leg. Yeah. 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 He was one of yeah. but the next guy up, Reimer, he stepped right up and, you know, did, did what he had to do. Yeah. Playos moved in a little, and they did all kinds of things. Because we had a kind of a great coach called Jimmy McNally. He's crazy one. But, oh yeah. Yeah, you know, he he was an innovator when he came off the line. And it just it just you got to keep going here. And, it, and uh, the thing about Kansas City too, you got of course you got a quarterback that just runs and throws sidearms and all kind of stuff mm -hmm. too. But then again, you saw Tampa Bay kind of a little less, you know. Yeah, they did. In defense, and, and once again, you got to figure out what's wrong. And, and get it done. That's cool to hear that you say you think Burrow is like Kenny and Boomer. Because, oh, yeah. I mean, you've obviously your history with the team, being around that and seeing that and saying that, that's very cool. But then, once again, to leave him by himself, you can't have just one quarterback or one running back like Mixon going to run the whole team. It just, you know, the old days, OJ Simpson with Buffalo, would he have 2,000 yards all the time? Mm -hmm. Buffalo never made a playoff the whole time he played with him. Yeah, I'd like to have seen Joe Burrow with the uh, the line that the Bengals had in the '80s with oh, yeah. Montoya yeah, and yeah. Munoz and all that. He, he would be he would probably be thrown for 600 yards a game. But yeah. uh, I know you just touched on OJ real quick. Who was the greatest non non Bengal player that uh, maybe that you were excited just as a as a fan standpoint to to when they uh, when they played the Bengals to get a C? Because I know you seen OJ. OJ was uh, unbelievable back in the day. I don't know. There's a lot of them come to my mind. Uh, Maybe your top three that uh, got you a little giddy inside that you got to watch them. Earl Campbell was a good one to watch. Earl Campbell was an excellent one. He was a good one to watch. Um, a couple of the other running. I, I, I like watching James Brooks. James Brooks is a great scat back. He's, mm -hmm. he's my all-time favorite bank he is, oh, he, he had a work that was out of this world. He'd run the stadium stands all the time. The steps. Yep. After practice, after warm up on Saturday, just it'd be like Tim. Tim would run laps around the track after the. He was boomer safety game, blanket. Around the uh, field after stuff like I mean, just he just guys like that. Earl Kim was a fantastic just a. A, a bull. You know, we had a guy by the name of Booby Clark. If you remember? Yeah. Right? Booby and Clark. Booby Clark. Yeah. Remember that? No, you no, would think no, of it now. <laughs> long time ago, and, yep. and, and he, uh, when I first was on the ground crew, he was great to watch. Yep. Gail Sayers was a wonderful guy to watch. Right? Yep. Uh, I shared with you before, one of the great middle linebackers, the only way 205, 210 pounds was 
Jack Lambert. Yep. Could he hit? Could he come fast? And could he hit? Now, what, how amazing was that? Because oh. you started in '75, so you got to yeah. see the steel curtain steel in their curtain. hay in their heyday. How hard was it to move the ball on that defense? Very hard. Yeah. But we got it done. In fact, our four and twelve season, we beat the Steelers three out of three out of, you know two out of three two out of two times we played them. Yeah, really. Two years in a row. That's that's unbelievable. And they were right. Super Bowl champs. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, you know, you have the likes of Mean Joe, Jack Everybody Lambert, Mel Blunt. Everybody steps up, see, when you play that game. Yeah. Yeah, a little sidekick to that. We were we had a snow game. We were sweeping the – you know, we were, you know when the snows were like, they, they stop and go to TV time, and they let the guys go and yeah. brush us and brush the lines off for them and stuff like that. And uh, we're out there brushing the line, and one of the little kids we had on the ground crew, he was out there – me and Joe Green got mad and a broom from him and broke in the head. <laughs> Look, he ran off the field. He ran off the field. He ran off the field and he quit. He never hey, <laughs> hey, it wasn't like that Coca-Cola commercial. No, hey, it kid, right. it was no, the exact right. opposite. No, so, right. Hey, but I wondered, I, I didn't get a chance to ask you real quick. Uh, you know, obviously being on the grounds crew and an equipment manager and stuff of that nature, uh, what is the one time that something didn't go to plan that uh, was maybe a major screw up or major, you know, gaff on your part that, uh, or something that made you nervous that something didn't go right. Oh dear! Is there any time that maybe something was forgotten? I don't think we have enough time left on the table. <laughs> <laughs> is there is, is there anything that uh, that you remember that comes to to mind that? No, uh, but there, there wasn't anything we really didn't forget because we always had backup. We always had trunks, extra stuff. What we couldn't at home games, we could run back to spinning and get. Guys wanted extra stuff. Biggest thing is when on the side, when the hardware fails on the mask or on the helmets, is that's why we tried to, during the week to check. We check shoulder pads, is put new straps on, you know, or put new hooks on and stuff like they were missing. And we carried all that in our packs and stuff. Yeah. But you know, in any game, you're on the sideline and something down, and you're fixing the helmet, and you got a coach and you're just calling you everything except yeah. your name. Yeah. <laughs> I want him back in the game now, and and you just. Sit there and you do your job and you get it done. In fact, yeah. in the game, it seems like it's an eternity, but yeah. a lot of times, you know, you drop the screw. There's a lot of something. pressure. I drop the helmet or I yeah. drop this, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, he's ready to kill me. And then you got used to that. And after that, a lot of times the coach would come over and say, Tiny, I wouldn't miss. I understand that, coach. Yeah. And I understand how you are because I want him back in too. And, and we do the most we can. A lot of times we'd have to go back to the toolbox behind the bench. Sometimes we had to cut off. The helmets because they were jammed or something yeah. happened. You're like so a basically the NASCAR pit crew on the football got, field. <laughs> the wire helmets would get bent in. You had to get them out. Sometimes we just put it on the ground, put our knee on them, bend them back enough to where we could get to where we're on offense or defense. And then we changed the mask real quick because we always carry spare. I think it's very cool that it's just how cool. you talk about it now. I can feel that yeah. you enjoyed what you did. I That's it. Cool. All these years later. Was it 20, 21 years yeah. after? Yeah. I really enjoyed being around it. Uh, I had a good time with it. I'm thankful for the Brown family let me be in there that long. I watched PV and Katie grow up. And, yeah, yeah. And their grandpa was a super guy. One, I can't talk about him enough. And Mike was wonderful letting us be around him. Tom was just wonderful. The knowledge he had about equipment uh, and the things how we got it done. Uh -huh. And uh, to move the team and not make those major mistakes. I just so there was always some. that trunk was left or this was left. Yeah. But that was always a way to being taken care of. Yeah. And, you know, you could always just go to the other team and borrow stuff and, and, you know, put a guy. We always had spare uniforms for the offensive line, the even line for being ripped off. The, their uniforms got a lot better. But back then, the, they had jerseys that were tearaway. Yeah. yeah. So always they had to have those. Earl Campbell them. loved those. Oh, he did. <laughs> and that's why they had them, but then they changed it because they wanted you out there in the field presentable. Yeah. So now that you can't rip a jersey off. Now, do you get to have them. reunions with the Bengals at all? Uh, do they do that Yeah, I run into them. They have weddings and stuff like that. Okay. Unfortunately, funerals. Yeah. And things like that. And, you know, Joe used to have over at the Freedom Center, he'd have a, a foundation. He had, he had, he'd have a big party for them. Well, I think I've donated a car or two to Joe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you know, went over for that. So yeah. See him. See him I, around town. See him all time. I just have one last question. How'd you get How'd you get the nickname Tiny? Well, there were some ladies when I bowled with Mick. Oh. And the oh. And <laughs> Whenever we, you start with there, some ladies. How'd you get the nickname Tiny? <laughs> some older ladies. Older ladies. Okay. I, we bowled, I belonged to the American Legion all mm -hmm. these years, and, and uh, 
there was this is ladies in the American, the, you know, the reserves and the ladies auxiliary and stuff. Mm -hmm. We used to bowl up there, and the women bowled before us, and we bowled after. Them. And I was just tall, and they just always, oh, well, you're awful tiny. And it's, they it just stuck. Uh, and they win. So, uh, very cool. Well, I've got a couple things I want to follow up with you, Tiny. Um, you know, one, one, I, I, I this is uh, basically for me. Uh, I, the 92-93 East Central Trojans cannot thank you enough for outfitting that whole football team. We, we were the best dressed football team with the nicest visors, hand warmers, gloves. So that was, uh, you know, we, we love that. It always comes back to the 92-93 Trojans. Listen, listen, listen. Did, you guys, did you guys win a game that year? <laughs> Easy there, Tiny. Oh, man. Hey, but listen, we... we, we we appreciate that, um, and then uh, you know. Last but not least, I want to know how long have you been married? The fifty years in July thirty first. Wow. And uh, it's your uh, and your wife's name's Joyce. Is that not correct? Yes. Yep. And I, I uh, you know, recently had found out that uh, you know her, her kidney is uh, failing. Yes. And uh, you know she is in need of a, a kidney transplant, right. and and that that hits him uh, to me because, uh, you know, my mother-in-law just recently got a kidney transplant. Wonderful. I was lucky enough to get a donor and, uh, you know, my wife, uh, down the road, she has, a, a, a kidney, uh, polycystic kidney disease, but she'll yeah. probably need uh, yeah. one down the road. So this does hit, uh, you know, near and dear to my heart. So I do want to encourage anybody watching, uh, if you want you. to be a donor, uh, we very definitely encourage you, uh, you know, the gift of life is the, the best thing that you could obviously uh, give. Uh, and I would want you guys to reach out to a Jessica Ratliff at Christ Hospital. She's the uh, head of the Donor Transplant and Parent Exchange uh, Coordinator. And uh, to reach her, reach her at 513-585-1427. I cannot encourage everyone enough. I've known several people that have had uh, kidney transplants in my life. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing uh, to be able to do that. Um, so uh, definitely uh, rooting. Your wife is, uh, makes the best beer cheese in the world. <laughs> you tried. You well, tried. I know. I tried oh, to match man. Joyce, but I've had hers a few different times, and uh, it's, it's not, not even close. Have. You do yeah. all right. Yeah, well, I do all right, right, but I'm telling you, Joyce, you haven't had uh, Joyce. Joyce is excellent. Wow. But, Tiny, again, we thank you. Thank you. I know we, we, you. we're definitely going to want to have you thank on you. for some more stories because I know 25 years We've only touched the uh, yeah. We've only touched the uh, the very tip of it. But uh, again, you, you've been a uh, you know been in my life for quite a quite a few years and a mainstay in the uh, the crony golf outing, yes. uh, which yes. uh, we we now have here as the honorary chairman. I oh think. boy! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but again, Tiny, we appreciate you uh, you know joining us today, and thank you, uh, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah.